Guardian Radio 96.9 FM. Fresh news, smart talk, all day. The views and opinions of the hosts and guests are their own and do not necessarily reflect the position of the management and staff of Guardian Networks. Welcome back to Guardian Radio, 96.9 FM, your station for fresh news, smart talk all day. It is Tuesday, the 9th of November, 2021, and you are on the clock with Erin Green. On the clock, we have conversations that help us understand and navigate a rapidly changing Bahamas. I wanted to play that song today. I wanted to play it yesterday. I think I can play it all week. Um, that song is called Daddy Daddy by Bagon, a.k.a. DeVito Bodie, and Bagon is a, uh, a legend in the Bahamian hip-hop game. This is uh, Bagon Money on the Ground, Bagon. Uh, the Coconut Tart Man, Bagon. And that song, Daddy, Daddy, has been an inspiration for me. For, you know, I'd say the song's almost 20 years old, for a long, long time. I love that song because for me, it speaks to the lived experiences of men I know in the Bahamas, right? It speaks to the lived experiences of men I know. And so while we try to get to terms with what's happening in our communities, the, the violence, the abuse, the degradation, we also have to remind ourselves of the good things and the positive things. Most of all, because those good things and positive things are a part of our overall solution. They don't just bring us joy, they bring us hope. That we can continue that. And yesterday I played a song by Damien Marley. I try to keep it as Bahamian as possible. But see, that song by Damien Marley is important. It's called For the Babies. I, wanna be, I, wanna, I always like to play these two songs together because... Often we think of ourselves as mimickers, right? As chameleons um, tagging along, copying what other people are doing. But if I'm not mistaken, I think DeVito wrote his song, Daddy, Daddy, before Damien Marley wrote For the Babies. And for me, there are tons of similarities in those songs. But those are two powerful black men with a very powerful message. And as an intersectional feminist, as a human rights advocate, an intersectional human rights advocate, it's important for me to recognize these things. You know what I've seen a lot 
in the, over the last couple of weeks, I've seen a lot of men walking with young boys, with baby boys, with boy children, holding their hands, guiding them across the road, talking with them, smiling with them, engaging them. And I noticed the universe reminding me that all is not lost. That if you focus on the negative all the time, all you will see is the negative. But if we focus on the positive with intention and empathy, with the intent of providing solutions for others, then focusing on the positive will not leave us in a state where we don't see the negative or don't think that we're connected to it or have an obligation or responsibility to help find resolution. Anyway, shout out to Bagon, DeVito Bodie for that classic song, Daddy, Daddy, because Bahamian daddies, y'all don't hear it enough. Y'all don't get the love enough. I know that. Anyway, blessings. Some more good news, some more positive news. If you are part of the Bahamian diaspora, living in the U.S. or Canada, please get a copy of the Thanksgiving issue of Bon Appetit, featuring our very, very own Brentford Hall. And make sure when you get it, right, when you get a copy of it, post it on social media and tag him in it, and tag the Bahamas in it. In fact, use the hashtag Bahamas to the world. That's Bahamas, T-O-D-A-W-O-R-L-D. And our very own Brentford Hall is featured in this Thanksgiving edition of Bon Appetit. I think in a story, if you go online, you search Bon Appetit New Providence restaurants. I've seen bits and pieces, but I'm going to grab my copy as soon as I can. And say congratulations to Brentford Hall, and thank you for always featuring and centering Bahamian culture and culinary history and culture in your work. If you want to call in and join the conversation today, you can call us at 323-6232-325-4316 or 325-4259. You can text us on the Guardian Radio text line. That's 422-4796, 422-GR96, and that's powered by BTC. Standard text rates apply. You can stream live audio and video on guardiantalkradio.com. You can listen on TV on Cable Bahamas, channel 969, or Flow, channel 612, or you can download the Guardian Radio app for your Apple or Android smart devices right on your phone. Remember, 323-6232, 325-4316, So we're continuing the conversation from yesterday. We touch a bit on... I don't want to say the tragic circumstances surrounding beautiful Bella's death because, as the police have shown us, we do not have sufficient data to speak publicly without potentially jeopardizing any legal action in the future. But we can talk about issues surrounding this case and similar cases if we do so responsibly. And that's the most important part. See, because at the root of the issue of what happened to baby Bella is an inability to govern and moderate oneself. And so we honor her by taking this first step or action and yes, we can speak about things in a responsible way without jeopardizing justice. 
We're going to continue that conversation, share some statements made by others, some ideas, talk a bit about the child uh, care, the Child Protection Act. But there's some other stuff in the news today that is also very, very interesting. In-person school starts in January at public schools. In the business section, in the Tribune, is a statement here by BTC, from the BTC Union. The headline is BTC shutdown, warning on mandatory vaccination. And I'm going to follow this story because, to be honest with you, I was in second that Bamian still wake at BTC. So the story is very fascinating to me. We talk about that. There's another very interesting story in the Tribune. We got some things and move back to the Guardian in a second. It's a headline: Car rentals, rogue operators, fact of life. I'm going to just read from that story, and it says, car rental companies say unlicensed operators are a fact of life, adding that a greater competitive problem is posed by hotels packaging vehicles and rooms with no permission to do so. Now, just that one paragraph I found fascinating. First of all, why do car rental companies believe that unlicensed operators are a fact of life? Don't we have a police force whose job it is is to investigate criminal enterprises? And surely an unlicensed car rental operation is a criminal enterprise? Don't we have a whole business, like a, a, a whole department of inland revenue? that concerns itself about people who are generating revenue but not paying the appropriate taxes? What do you mean it's just a fact of, what you mean it's just a fact of life? We get people going to jail every day for not having enough money to make sense of themselves. But you're telling me you're just prepared to run a whole industry with rogue operators moving around it? And then when you get to the latter half of the paragraph, you could understand why these guys may feel this way. Because when you suggest that hotels are creating packages, services, that they have no authorization to create and are getting away with it, then a lowly little car operator would say, what well, well, if the hotels could get away with it? Who am I? But I just want to say to anybody who was reading that and thought that that made sense, it cannot make sense. But more importantly, as a regular citizen and road user, for, and first, as a regular citizen and road user, understanding that we're approaching Christmas time, understanding that criminal elements like to use rental cars, to engage in their skulduggerous activities. It would be of the, the, the police's highest priority to get a grip on the car rental industry and any rogue operators. Knowing that people, there are more Bahamians on the ground, car rentals increase at Christmas time, road usage increases at Christmas time, you would think that the police force would take it as a very high priority to ensure that there are no rogue rental car operators about there. And since the government is all about taxation, this seems to be, I mean, it's a no-brainer. But please, yeah, somebody fix that, please, because that just doesn't make any sense. It couldn't. I see you got a call on the line. Call you on the clock. Good morning to what? Good morning. Yes, you know, like they're just the, uh, the government's coonies, you know, who, 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 who have their mom just to word with this, them and these, uh, what you call it, uh, 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 partial mandates, you know. 
Well, like for sporting events and, and cultural events for, okay. for both participants and, and our spectators, you know, Paul, as Paul. well as, as, as this... Uh, Hold on, you're this, referencing the story in today's Guardian, government will focus attention on cultural entertainment sectors? Yeah, I mean, yeah. On, on, on the vaccine mandate, you know, and, and, uh, and the bills and, 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 and as, 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 as in, in the House, debating in the House, right? Yeah, yeah. As, as well as, as, as this government... Uh, 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 what you call it, asking for for, 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 for for socialism as pertains to climate change. We are, we are at home, they, you know, they're saying that the poor people, no free lunch for the poor people, you know. All it, right, it, so it, let's, it, let's start, I, hold on, let's start here, because you, you said a mouthful, and it's very interesting, and actually, I was going to touch on all of these things, and I think in a similar way to you. For me, right, I'm concerned about the debating of, I'm concerned about the bills to entrench provisions from the state of emergency COVID protocols into ordinary legislation. Right, and, and it's, it's the same thing that is no different from, from when, when the, the, the former government was, was, was there, you know, just, at, just another man is the uh, competent authority. But it's, it's, a, it's a bigger issue than that. There's a mass Yeah, yeah it's a, the law, you know, when, you know, what are you going to do, amend the law after this, uh, you know? Right. COVID situation the, is gone. And what the state of emergency does is it allows you to govern with flexibility. Right. And then it tells you when that state that, requ that requires that degree of flexibility has, has diminished or ended, right. then you can go back to ordinary legislation. So for right. me, why are we at the ordinary legislation stage if the pandemic is not over? Right. You know, but but you know, please but please address the social issues. We have minor safety net that, that these people going and begging these these large countries and thing to help them out. You know why why should they be concerned of, of, of what's going on in the water when when them the rich people all over the world is it? You know they can escape these issues. You know, but here at home we got uh, we got social issues. We got we don't have access to health care, and, and and the rich people among us that the. You know, they're not concerned. They're just saying it's our fault that, that we don't have good jobs or are making good salaries. So, you know, that's, you know, it's cronyism is killing us, man, you know. It's killing us, you know. They, you know, they do. We, 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 cronyism is what we, what we do in government. And, and, and the cronies, they, they no. make noise for the health gang. And that's it. Thank you much. Listen, thank you. And, um, yeah, you said a, you said a mouthful, right? So let's start at the beginning. For me, I'm very concerned about the debate in the House on the new, on the new bills, COVID bills, because when the emergency has dissipated, right, or, or when the situation that required a state of emergency has dissipated, then you get rid of the special restrictions. But if we're still in the pandemic, why are you moving to ordinary legislation? And why are we not having a real conversation about it? Because y'all don't have real conversations in the House of Assembly. And like the caller said, ultimately, you're still just putting all the authority back into the Prime Minister's hand. We've seen within the first few weeks of this new government that the political culture in governance has not shifted sufficiently to change that, although you do see a, 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 you do see a shift with ministers having a larger degree of autonomy, but nothing to suggest that the prime minister wouldn't be ultimately in control of these decisions. And so why the quick rush? What has changed? How have you built the capacity at the Ministry of Health to take on this role, this function of oversight for COVID pandemic issues? Isn't, isn't, isn't PHA and Ministry of Health and Wellness already, aren't they already overwhelmed? But I also thought you were talking about, like I said, this article in today's Guardian. Government will focus attention on cultural 
entertain and entertainment sectors, Senator Rohl says. I thought you were talking about that as well. Um, but the BTC mandate, vaccine mandate discussion is also very, very interesting because I don't know if our government realizes that we can't we can't survive any real industrial unrest at this time. You can't survive if BTC shuts down due to unrest. Y'all are barely surviving now with a quote unquote functional BTC. Please take these matters seriously. Not as a matter of politics, you know, but as a matter of good governance and ensuring that your citizens have the things they need to function in their society. Got a text here, Ms. G. Okay, I can. I'm gonna get back to that text. Another text, great show as usual. The Baby Bella incident is not an isolated incident. When these bus drivers be sleeping and messing with these schoolgirls is the same thing, but that's just my five cents. Great show as usual. I have a car rental company and I heavily monitor people I rent cars to. Let's talk about, um, let's talk about that car thing and then we get back to the Baby Bella thing. The Baby Bella thing is big. It's big. Car rental company owner saying that they have to heavily monitor people they rent cars to. So let me ask you a question. Are car rental companies required by law to put tracking devices in their cars? Right? Now I see this as a good thing. Could be dealing with theft and a police force that has tremendous difficulty dealing with auto theft. I don't. I don't get it, right? But at the same time, there is a privacy issue because if I rent a car from you, right, I don't necessarily want my travel info to be in the ether. Now, it's a good idea that if I'm renting your car, you have a GPS or something on it. So in case something happens to me in the car, you could find me and the car. But there also has to be accompanying regulations to govern who has access to that data and why, and to, to govern standards for companies in terms of security to secure the hard devices, the hardware that stores that information. There's just so many things, but this is a big thing. Car rental uh, industry needs heavy, heavy, regulation, not just to support the growth of the industry, not just to protect consumers, but to protect general road users. So the person texts back and says, it's not by law, it's not law to put trackers on the car. This is what I'm saying. Maybe we need legislation to grow this industry. Also, are car rental companies requiring insurance on these vehicles? Are car rental companies prepared to cover liability if one of their clients or customers injure someone in their vehicle. These are all important things. These are things that have to be thought about. You can't just go rent two plate and slap it on a car and say, ah, rental company. So some more news, some more news. On Thursday, November the 11th, we have the Annual Memorial Anatole Rogers Lecture, hosted by UB. And this year's guest speaker 
is going to be renowned writer Edwidge Danticat. And this is going to be, a, I'm sure this is going to be a fantastic discussion. I'm trying to organize a larger discussion about this event on Thursday and about several other events that are being hosted by UB in the month of November, including a discussion about the works of Sylvia Winter, which is just going to be a fascinating. And then another event about, uh, called Voices Across the Diaspora, featuring a number of regional writers and poets, including our very own Pat Ramming and Asha Lalawatu Ramming. Uh, it's going to be a great discussion. I see we got a caller on the line. Caller, you're on the clock. Hey, Dave, this is Dr. Inouye. So long with you, Aaron. Hey, G Green. good morning, Brayman. But like, if you keep saying that these people can know, I practice obey. Say it again? I say, if you keep saying that these people can know, I practice obey. Shh. Why you say that? If you, keep, if you keep speaking about the magic of my eyes, they can know the truth. <laughs> when a, <laughs> what that has nothing to do with obey? You'd be surprised. When a blind man says that... You see, some people tell me I should tell you not to say that on the air, Brayman. That's, not, that's not somebody... They you get of, you, they get you, offended you, by that, right? Who go, who got offended? Couple people. They they don't they don't tell me their name, and you, I say to them that look at the beauty in the world around you. Look at the poetry around you. That when somebody who is visually impaired says that I love this person's eyes, right? I don't take it as them being fast or or flirtatious. I take it as them saying that when this person speaks, it feels like I can see the world through their eyes. But, but, and but, to me, that's a little obeyish, and I love it. Well, the, the thing is, um, uh, Aaron, yes. you are your own woman. Yes. And if somebody, would somebody, would, would somebody think of you and somebody else heard it, that doesn't concern them. Right, but, Brayman, at the same time, we don't live in isolation. We live in communities with other people. And yeah, it's, as, it's important that, at the very least, we interrogate what it is we're saying, and we ensure that when we speak, we speak with empathy and mindfulness, and we're not creating a less safe environment for other people. Well, uh, Aaron... Uh People that think things like that, persons or persons in which you speak of, yeah, they are short-sighted. That's right, and they can't see the magic and the beauty around them. Right, or they are jealous. Right. How you doing? I'm only. Other than I want to say that we need justice, law, and some more understanding in this country. But mm -hmm. most of all, justice, law, and order. Absolutely. Uh, but what I want, the, the reason why I called, right? Mm -hmm. My main reason, as he, he was speaking of um, uh, licensing cars and... Uh, car rent, the car, car rental industry. The yeah. thing is, the license doesn't take care of, you know, liability. The insurance takes care of liability. Mm -hmm. You see? But you can't get your car licensed without insurance. Uh, well, okay, but still, mm -hmm. uh, the thing is, if somebody were to get hit with that car, the insurance is supposed to take care of it. Yeah. If, especially if the person, uh, uh, if the car hit the person in a legal illegal manner. Yeah. If the car, if right, if the car is liable or responsible for the accident. Right. Yeah. That's all I want to say. Thank you, Brayman. And thank you. Stay beautiful. Thank you, Brayman. You know, I wanted to say, I wanted to take that opportunity because a lot of people have raised it with me and they think that it, it, Brayman saying that is a little forward. And I say to them, listen, I appreciate the critique. And I appreciate because the conversation we're going to be having over the next few days, not just on my show, but you're going to hear people talking about it, is about our communities, how we construct them, how we maintain them. Do we really 
consider and take responsibility for the part that we play in our communities? Do we measure our speech before we speak? Do we question, interrogate whether what we're saying is creating a less safe or a more safe environment for others around us, including children? I had a conversation recently on the same show about visibility and young people and sexuality, and that as an advocate, while I work for visibility for my community, because I think visibility is important, I also measure my own work and my own desire for visibility with the need to ensure that young people are safe, particularly in spaces that we have no control over. We're going to be having lots of conversations with parents, encouraging them to consider how important it is to create safe space for your children, even when there is no space available, the importance of moderating the music that you play in your car, the importance of moderating the language that you use in front of them, the types of clothes that they wear. We had this period in time when we were buying little children clothes that said things like sexy on them. And we heard tons of adults talking about them. My children, I can raise them. And it's just clothes. There's nothing wrong with this. We can have lots of those conversations. I got a caller on the line. Caller, you're on the clock. I'm pleasant. Good morning, Miss Green. How are you doing? I'm good. Thank you, Sparky. How are you? And I'd like you to take, give me a moment as I congratulate Bremen. You know, I hear people make that comment about Bremen, like you just said. And I admire Bremen for the many years. Miss Green, I don't know if you remember one time ago, there was never a thing called talk show in the Bahamas. Mm -hmm. The talk show, the, the radio waves were open. You only could see politicians on ZNS one time ago on TV or listen to them on radio. Mm -hmm. And then the scripts were also planned before they even went on the, the, the announcements of the you know, special and special that are the arts and so forth to get special answers. They had us, you know, going their way. And then they opened up the, the radio waves, and then we started on Monday night, and they used to call us the, the chronic callers. But look how far, in talking about our communities, how far talk show has grown. When Steve McKinney and and and, and Pice them used to have the talk show up on the at 10 o'clock at night. Mm -hmm. When people like me and Bremen and, and Bannister... And JT and them, they used to call us chronic callers. Mm -hmm. And we've been there for years and years, and still here today, Bannisters left us. But then the, that's what some of those people used to call us chronic callers and used to tell us stay off the radio were the same people who became talk show hosts. And look how talk show hosts has grown. One time from one or two talk shows, then one, then one came on Jones Radio with Daryl Miller. Mm -hmm. And now look how much talk show hosts we got right on got in. Right. From 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. And then it going on all night. And listen, I was, one of, I was one of those people who became a chronic caller. And then because of my advocacy and trying to find a way to engage the collect, the public voice, right? The public air. And then look here, yeah, he's a radio show host too now. But now, look, look at another thing that happened out of all of this. Mm -hmm. Even myself, you got some people out there would like to criticize Sparky also, but they wouldn't bring their voice on the radio so I would know what it is. It could be a friend of mine talking mine about what they'll do is they'll text him. Right. They'll complain with Sparky on a text. Now, now, but Sparky, they wouldn't put their voice there so I could pick out who they are. Right. Now, Sparky, look here. Let me, let me take what you've said. Let me take that and turn... Because... I know what you're saying, but here's what I'm saying. I want some of those people to join the conversation, right? Now, let me tell you why. Because when issues like justice for baby Bella come up, 
It's not just important for the government to hear the voices of the people you know. It's important for other Bahamians to hear the voices of the people. Because the only way that this culture of sexual predation, that's when you prey on those who are weaker than you for your own sexual agenda. This rape culture, this culture of taking advantage of the weak, the only way it has been able to entrench itself even deeper in our communities is because we refuse to talk about it. Now, at the same time, we have to acknowledge that we cannot demand that people come into the public on the radio and say, I have been wronged for us to take them seriously. And we must also acknowledge that not everybody can call into the radio. Not everybody can afford to have a public voice. Not everybody can safely contribute publicly, right? We, we appreciate that greatly. So we attempt to find balance. That's what we do. We attempt to find balance. But the radio show thing can't work without the callers, but this community thing can't work unless we talk to each other. And that's why the space is so important. Got a text here that says, good morning, Ms. Green. I love your talk show. I know we are on a different topic, but I have a situation with NIB. I've been unemployed and I'm waiting on an unemployment check from January. I've not received a single payment yet. Is there anyone you can get who I can speak to directly about this issue? Every time I go there in person, I get the runaround and I'm not allowed to talk to anyone. Okay, so we're throwing this out to the general public. If you work for NIB and you can provide some assistance, we just need information. We just need you to tell us what to do, not to do it for us. Please, message the show, leave a contact for me, and I will get it between today and tomorrow. Another text about the rental company. We can do, I can do a whole show on it because it's a big and it's a, it, that's an interesting discussion. We got to talk about it because no industry could, could be sitting like that saying, well, there's nothing we could do. Yes. I got a text here that said, I've read works by Edwidge Danticat. She's Haitian American. Yes, she is Haitian American. Um, I think it's going to be a fantastic discussion. So I got a caller on the line. Caller, you're on the clock. Good morning, caller. You still there? Hello? Hi, good morning. You listening to me? Yes, ma'am. Yes, I am calling in because I always get cut off. Well, listen, I am going to apologize to you right now. Um, and I'm going to say to you, get a private technician to check out your phone line because neither I nor the producer did that just now. Um, I... Wow, I'm sorry that you got cut off. Call back in. There's a couple other things I want to touch on. We haven't finished talking about COP26 and the statement by the Prime Minister. And then the article, uh, Sharon Turner's perspective yesterday. That was a very interesting article. I want to talk about it a bit more. As I know, I, I, I talked about it, a um, little political satire, and I'm not sure everybody understood what I was saying. You see, for me, the problem with the speaker is, there's no problem. There ain't no problem with the speaker. There is no problem. But I think there's a problem with the FNM and leadership. Because this is not the first time that an FNM MP and cabinet minister has quote unquote used uh, a woman or women's issues or our collective sentiments about women 
in leadership and women generally to attempt to position themselves for leadership in their own party. Like I said in my commentary, I think that was on uh, Thursday maybe, um, this is not the first time. And it appeared as if Iram Lewis, in his attempt to prove that he would make a great leader for the FNM, took this moment to establish his authority in the house. And like I said, it's not the first time that members of an FNM government have done that. And when I say government, the opposition is the government too, in case you didn't know. But in 2014, Loretta Butler Turner did the same thing, where it appears as if she used that 2014 referendum and, cons well, and Bahamian's general sentiments around same-sex marriage to launch her unofficial campaign against Hubert Minnis for leader of the FNM. So you see, when I see this letter by Carl Kulmer talking about how concerned the FNM, the FNM are about the status of women in this country, I'm not sure I understand. Because it appears as if Iram launched that tirade simply in a, an attempt or because he thought he had a weaker opponent, that this would make him look good. And we all for fun and games, as the political class is, but we're not going to let you attempt to mash down a woman to make yourself look stronger and bigger. But see, it isn't just about man versus woman. Because both men and women can perpetuate patriarchy. Both men and women can perpetuate violence against women. Both men and women can perpetuate violence against the most vulnerable among us. But Loretta Butler took a whole referendum and used it to gain a few points over Hubert Minnis. It seemed like a culture in the FNM that has to be addressed by, with more than just a few pretty words in a letter to the editor. And it's similar to the critique that I offered to Obi Wilchcombe yesterday in a statement from the Ministry of Social Services. There is no spirit of malnourished social dynamics attacking children is real people attacking children. People that you could identify and investigate and lock up and penalize. Not a spirit of dysfunction or evilness that we could just sit back and pray about. But actual people that need to be identified and prevented from doing these things ever again. I got a text here, quickly, for the person that texted about NIB. The NIB texter needs to check the bank account they gave NIB. They have a habit of depositing funds but not notifying you when the deposits have started. But if you gave the wrong bank info, your money could be going to someone else's account. The process is problematic and ripe for fraud. 
So go in and verify that all of your information is correct. And we'll continue, I'll continue to try and find someone for you to talk to. That's my music. We got to go to a break. So stay tuned to Guardian Radio 96.9 FM. We'll be right back. What happened to you? You look like you lost your paycheck. A man, I just realized I got scammed out of a bunch of money. They said I won this contest and just needed me to send them some money so I could collect. I mean, to expedite something. Or was it to smooth the process? Man, you're smarter than that. Protect yourself against scams and fraud by following these tips. If you know you didn't enter a competition, you can't win. Never pay to receive a cash prize. If you're being asked, you're being scammed. Check trusted internet sites for verification of information given to you. Do not give your banking details to people you don't know. If it sounds too good to be true, it is. Monitor your bank account regularly for any questionable transactions. Get more information at GetMoneySmartBahamas.com At Fidelity, the holidays are all about family, spending time with loved ones, and being thankful for the little things in life. Worrying about bills should be the last thing on your mind, especially during the holidays. Let Fidelity help you get your bills under control. Fidelity can also get you started with a real savings plan that actually pays you interest. The only thing you need to think about is what you will do with the savings in your pocket this Christmas. Now that's what I'm talking about. Fidelity Bank is here for you this holiday season because you are family and family is important to us. This is Guardian Radio 96.9 FM, National Good morning and welcome back to Guardian Radio 96.9 FM, your station for fresh news, smart talk all day. Boy, that song by Bagon, I love that. He said, no other love like they mommy, but I still want them around me. Right? That's a father that understands, Right? that understands that while his children are the light of his world, that he must share that love with others, and he must share them with the world. And imagine the stress and uh, apprehension and fear that parents have when letting their children out into the world. You know, these daddies will be with them 24-7. Our boy, baby Bella. Okay, I got a text here that says, Aaron, this is the first time in over 40 years that the FNM didn't send a woman to parliament. They have no shame, no moral authority to criticize the PLP. Man, I did like it all the way till you got to the point where you said no moral authority to criticize the PLP. But not, no. See, I agree with you. They don't. I just, why did you stop there? You know? Why did you stop there? Why you didn't continue with, they have no moral authority to make decisions on our behalf in this regard as well. But, um, yeah, I just wanted to put that out there. I've been thinking about that. I, uh, I thought that was problematic. And I don't know if we see what happened between the member of the House and the Speaker as a part of the larger issues we're dealing with right now, including the environment, you know, how do we address the environments that we allow, environments in which things happen, like what happened to baby Bella 
And I'm making this point here. All that we know is that there's some form of negligence or harm, and the child died while in care of someone who had responsibility for her. It's important that we talk about that, how we model our behavior for younger people. What are our rights as adults in communities and spaces? And what are our responsibilities? And what obligations do we have to the vulnerable in our communities? That's my music. That's the end of the show today. You see, the reason why I sort of entertained Sparky a little this morning, because what he was saying was very interesting. And it sort of feeds this conversation. The government pays attention to what we pay attention to. I wanted to do a sort of an open line show to allow people to call in and text in with what's on their mind. I wanted to see if the Baby Bella story is still pressing for us. If we understand our responsibility as the wider community to inundate the airwaves with what it is we want to hear. Let's talk about it, Bahamas. These are the things that are most important to us. And while people are not talking about their personal trauma, trust me, every time you look to your left and you look to your right, you are looking at somebody who has been deeply affected by predation, sexual violence in our communities. Let's prioritize these issues. Anyway, it is 11 o'clock. Thank you for texting in. Thank you for joining the conversation. But I got to go. It's 11 a.m. Levon Miller and Unleashed is up next. Have a great day. And remember, these children one day, mommy, and they die. Have a great day, mom. Really are dead Fs, they failed them, nailed them, telephone hailed them, show up all cool at the school graduation, didn't help them study, only brought a PlayStation, keeping up her parents ain't the art of a parent, you only want some man, but your child come back true, and then you busy looking for children that come help you, they want it all.